Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So welcome. Welcome, everybody. How's everybody today? Good? All right, all right. So what schools are here? If somebody could tell me what schools are here. What's the name of your school? Which one is it? OK, got you. Another school? Nice, nice. Another one? Which one? Got you. Nice. Cool, cool. Any other school? Ooh, a lot of schools. How about that? How? Phoenix, nice. OK, cool. Nice. Awesome. That's great. Anybody else? Great. So this is fantastic, guys. Um, many students from many schools coming together to learn about career, about technology, about life choices. And this is sort of a path that I'm going to take you through today. It's going to be a journey where we're going to be talking about technology. We're going to be talking about my career. We're going to be talking about some things that I've done. And hopefully, you could enjoy the, the path and the journey that we're going to take today. And also, hopefully, you could learn. And please feel free to ask any questions that you have. It may be a small question, a big question, or anything, because I'm here to share with you uh, information and stuff. And uh, I want you to just take something with you today that you could utilize uh, once you step out of the door. Right? You could utilize in your school or in your personal life, or, or maybe take an example of what we're going to see today and just say, take some action with the information that we're going to share with you guys. OK? Sounds like a plan? Yeah? All right, cool. I better, an A. I like that. Could you do that again? Yes, I like that. See, I like that attitude. That's awesome. OK, so today we're going to go um, and see what I said, technology, career, and life choices. And uh, let's see if this works. How do you put this? There you go. So before I start, I wanted to share with you guys this, um, this little writing that I wrote last time that I came here. And uh, if somebody could read it for me in, out loud, if anybody could read it for me, anybody volunteer? OK, cool. Just make it loud so people go hear you. Louder, louder. You have to get there. Hold on, hold on. You have to get out there, explore, search, travel, meet people, and go to events, and keep on searching until you find what really makes you happy. Awesome. So, so this is basically, guys, the, the journey that I've taken. I've pretty much really go out there, met, met people, visit places, went to events, explore and search and everything, because we always find it for that answer to our life. So, so if you guys could take this with you and just embed it in your mind if you can, and this will take you places. It's not the formula for things, but at least it's, this will take you places, OK? So this is sort of the journey that we're going to go through today, uh, sort of the agenda. So I want to share with you guys where I came from, uh, the beginnings of my career, my life in the US, uh, the education that I went through, my career path, and the countries that that career uh, path took me to, uh, the challenges and accomplishments that, we're gonna, that I faced uh, through the whole career, also the entrepreneurial part, right? The entrepreneurial role that I decided to take and also why I decided to become an entrepreneur, or why I think of myself as an agent of change, and I'll share with you guys what that means. And also, what is it that I'm doing? What is my vision uh, about uh, this company that I, that I started? And at the end, as Kate mentioned, we're gonna have a Q&A session where you guys could ask any questions whatsoever, okay? Cool, so let's begin the journey. So basically, this is where I came from. You guys know on the left, you see the whole America's map. I was born in South America, and I was born in Bogota, Colombia, the country on top. And I was raised in Quito, Ecuador. You know, very different countries, even though they are small, uh, but they're very different countries. Colombia is, uh, is a country known for uh, coffee. You know, anybody has a Colombian coffee before? Oh, there you go. Oh, a couple of guys. OK, cool. So Colombian coffee is, is known because of the quality of the coffee, right? So I'm, I'm very proud to be part of, of Colombia because they produce the best coffee ever. And the difference between the coffee is exactly what's going on right now. The coffee is picked by hand, right? So they take each of the beans and they pick it by hand, and they pick the ones that are red. The ones that are red are the best quality beans, and those are the ones that we use in Colombia to export to other countries. Uh, if we were to compare this to Brazil, for instance, Brazil uses machines to pick up the coffee. 
So when they're picking out the coffee, they pick up the green beans and the red beans, and they mix them together. And so the quality of the coffee is a little less than, than that, OK? So that's sort of the process. Uh, on the top left, uh, that's sort of the outside Bogota, where I was born. And that's sort of the architecture that you will see when you go to Colombia and you visit different cities in there. Very picturesque, a lot of colors. Uh, you see how beautiful the balconies look and everything. The city below on the, on the right, that's Bogota, Colombia. That's where I was born. Uh, it's a capital city. It's a big city, buzzing, uh, and it's happening. It's a great city. And, after, uh, is, uh, and above is the flag. That's the Colombian flag. Okay? Now, this is Ecuador. I was, I was raised in Quito, Ecuador. In Quito, Ecuador is very interesting. One, because we have the same exact flag, but <laughs> the difference that has a seal in the middle. And as you could see in the middle of the, of, the, of the seal, there is a volcano, and it's covered with snow. That's the same volcano, volcano that, that is in this picture right here. And that one is called the Cotopaxi. The Cotopaxi is a Quechua name, and that's how they call it. And bottom right, you see the llamas. That's where llamas come from. A group of friends there. Yeah. And uh, have you guys seen one of these live? Anybody? Oh, yeah, where do you see it? What a future? Awesome, that's great. Awesome. And somebody else there too? Somebody saw a llama there? Anybody else? Oh, right there. Okay. Nice. Nice. Beautiful animals, right? And the reason why I mention it is because um, llama has become like a product in Ecuador as well. They, they actually use the cotton for the llama and they. They actually sell them and trade them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very, very nice thing. Here on the bottom left, that's uh, a city close to El Cotopaxi. And even though the volcano is, is, is pretty much, it's not active, quite active, but it's smoking. So you could be in that city. It's kind of scary seeing the volcano kind of smoking a little bit. Um, so, but it's not, it's not active at all. Uh, on, on top, I wanted to share with you these guys. Remember before when we saw um, South America and there was a line crossing? the continent, that's the equator, or that's the line of the equator, right? So that divides the North Hemisphere and the South Hemisphere. So if you guys could see on the top left, the lady that is there, she's standing right in the middle of the world, North Hemisphere and South Hemisphere. So that's an amazing uh, uh, place to be when you are right in the middle of the, of, of the world. Has anybody been to Ecuador by chance? Oh, right there. Awesome. What do you think about it? Awesome. That's great. Good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, so that's Ecuador. And now, this is, uh, when I came to the U.S., I came to the U.S. in 89. And um, I lived in several places. And these are the places that I lived. I, I went to New York City, great city. I lived there, I lived there for five years. Um, when I started working, and this is sort of kind of, you know, the, the platform that kind of took me to where I went. When, when I started working, I was a waiter. And I was a waiter at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, a very fancy hotel, and we had fancy uniforms and all that. And, and I was going to school. I was learning English. I went to Hunter College. And uh, I was a waiter for a couple of years where I learned the language and everything. So that really helped me uh, because I was making money, but I was also going to school. So I lived there for five years. Then I moved to San Francisco. And in San Francisco, I lived like 17 years. Um, San Francisco was an amazing choice. And, and it's funny because um, when I was learning English, I had a teacher who told me that the most beautiful city in the U.S. was San Francisco. And I said, oh, I'm going to go and check it out. Let me just go and check it out. So I came here in 93, and I loved it. I was like, oh, I'm moving to, to San Francisco. And I moved here in 94. Um, so I love San Francisco. And then, because of my education, I moved to Washington and Virginia. So that's Washington, D.C. on the top right. And you guys see the church over there? in the picture, in the background, that's the church uh, located in my school. And I'll tell you what school that is. And then I was also living in Virginia. It's just south of, uh, of Washington. That's a very nice state as well. Uh, have you guys visited any of these states at all? Anybody? Oh, nice. Oops, a lot of people. Awesome. So where, where do you go? Washington. Oh, wow. You see, you've been traveling. That's awesome. <laughs> that's great. How about that? Where again? Oh, wow. He's been there to all of them. That's nice. That's awesome. 
And, and you know, I, I love that because, you know, he's, you know, you're not afraid to explore places, right? Exactly. You're not afraid to meet new people, right? That's great. Exactly. And that's what I'm trying to communicate, guys. If you want to find something in your life, you have to go out there and, and, and explore it and find it and travel. Where have you been? Nice, nice, traveling, that's awesome. Traveling is enriching, right? Teach, teaches you a lot of stuff. Anybody else? Go ahead. Oh, nice, San Francisco, that's perfect. That's awesome, it's a great city, right? What do you like about it? The Golden Gate Bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge, nice, yeah, that's awesome. Cool, cool. You see, we have a lot of people traveling here, that's awesome, nice. Okay, so now, this is the part where I wanted to share with you about my education. So I started in high school uh, in Ecuador, in Quito, Ecuador, uh, bottom right. That's the Jack that cross uh, high school. And, and it's funny because uh, we had horses at the at school. And during breaks, we could actually ride the horses and just kind of go around. And, and it was a big campus, a huge campus, and I loved it. And I played soccer. I was playing soccer for the, for the school. And it was against other high schools and everything. And, and that's when I injured my knee and I stopped playing soccer altogether. But I was very active. I ended up being the, uh, the president of the student council in, in, in high school. And through that, we did a lot of programs within the high school. So I was always very active. I was always very involved with the other students and with, uh, with the uh, teachers and managers and all that because I always wanted to, to learn. I always wanted to explore. I always wanted to find new things. So I was, I was always very active. So from high school, you know, I graduated, I came to the U.S., and I landed in California. And I went to top right, I went to Notre Dame de Namur. Have you guys heard of Notre Dame de Namur down here in Belmont? You have what again? I couldn't hear you. Okay. All right, cool, cool, awesome. So it's a, it's a small school, it's a private school down in Belmont, just a few miles away from here maybe around 4,000 students today. Uh, and I got a degree there uh, in marketing and international business. And the reason why I'm sharing with you about the degree is because that's not my career today. So even though I got a degree in, in marketing and international business, that's not what I do today. So time went by, I graduated from, from college, and um, I graduated with honors and all that, and I was very involved in clubs as well, and, I was involved in, uh, in the student council, I was involved in, in sports clubs and things like that. And, and I couldn't emphasize more, guys, the importance of really getting involved in your school. You know, uh, if you have a passion, if you like something, then go for it, pursue it. Just meet all the people that, are, that are, they like the same thing. So go to clubs uh, within the school that, uh, that they are organizing events on, on what you like. So get involved, get, get, meet people and everything. So I was always very involved with a, with a degree. Um, then I started working. Then I started working, and, and I think the master's degree came down the road. It was, it was a, sort of a natural step in my career, and it wasn't um, a decision that I made based on, okay, I have to get a master's degree. It sort of kind of came organically into my life. Kind of it was time for me to learn something new, to get a new challenge, uh, to meet new people, maybe travel a little bit more. Uh, but in the meantime, in the meantime, what I did, before I even got my master's degree, I attended um, a, um, a course at UCLA. So I'm a UCLA alumni too. And I got a management certificate. And at the time, I was working as a consultant, and I wanted to learn something about management. So I got the certification there at UCLA. And after that, um, you know, my life kind of became interesting in the sense because I was looking for something different. I was looking for something that I will feel in my chest, that will make me passionate, but I also needed the knowledge to, to get there, right? And, and then I decided, you know, I think it's time for me to, to go for my master's degree. And, and I tell you guys, I went to a, to a, to a seminar uh, with different universities uh, up in California, the Fairmont Hotel, and there were top universities there. Harvard was there, and Brown, and Yale, and all the big names. But, you know, but I wasn't feeling it. I wasn't like, I don't know if this is the program that I like. I wasn't really too sure. Um, and I'm about to leave, and I'm actually walking out of the seminar. 
Um, and that lady said, hey, are you leaving? I said, yeah. I said, have you met with Georgetown? I'm at Georgetown. I said, no, I haven't. Oh, you should meet with them. I said, okay. So I went and met with the representative from Georgetown. And uh, from the moment they started talking with me and they showed me the brochure, and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I'm looking for. This is what I like, the traveling, the international component, the globalization, technology, and, and I loved it. So, so I applied to Georgetown. Um, they had a lot of applicants. They admitted 40 of us to the MBA program. And, and it was a program designed for uh, working people, right, for executives. So the program really took us to many places. And I want to share that with you guys in a little bit. Um, so it, it was an amazing, amazing path. Any questions about this part whatsoever? Any comments or questions that? Okay, cool. So moving on, uh, what is really the meaning of, of your education today, or, or my education, or the education of anybody? What is the meaning, really? Can anybody tell me what is the purpose, what is the meaning of it? Hmm? Can I give you a microphone real quick? Is that cool? Thank you. So everybody could hear what you had to say. It's very important. Uh, the purpose of education is to teach us kids and to make us smart so when we're like more bigger, we could uh, help uh, make um, th this country uh, better and stuff. Great. Awesome. Awesome answer. Wow. Look at the speaker. Anybody else? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the microphone real quick. The education is that we can learn about what we're passionate about and what we right. want to do in life. Exactly, exactly. That's a very important life. That's, do, you, do you guys hear what she said? The purpose is to learn what we are passionate about and what we li like in life. That's very important. That's the, the driving force. Anybody else like that? Over there. <laughs> I'll take this. <laughs> um. The, the purpose of education is to, in a way, just, well, get educated, but it allows, like he said, for the country to be a better place, and the education in and of that is to make you... Anything comes to your mind. To make you what? You you'll think about it. You'll think about it. Get back to us. You think about it for sure. Yeah, because there are so many things, right? Cool. Anybody else? Um, I think education is about um, based learning laws and learning what's right. Uh, and what's wrong, and having fun. Good. That's very important, having fun too. It's not only about studying, but getting involved and, and just enjoying that journey. Anybody else? And we have two more, and then after you. Do you want the mic? Did you get the mic? It gives you opportunities and gets you ahead in life. Opportunities to show you the path in life? Awesome. That's great. Awesome. Behind you? The meaning. The meaning of education is to understand life and stuff and stuff that you might face in the future. Awesome, great, thank you. And we have those two more. And with that. Um, education basically just puts a title to your name and gives you opportunities in future lives. It's for what again? I miss you. Um, in the 21st century, education just puts a title to your name. Yeah. So you have more opportunities. Like that too, yeah, exactly, exactly. And also validates what you've done. You're right. Uh, opportunity, I mean, education makes you learn and expands your brain to mm -hmm. learn more information. That's great. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate that. And, and all of the things that you guys mentioned is exactly what education is about, plus learning other things, right? And what I really like about your answers today is that none of you actually talked about 
reading a book or learning math or getting better at statistics. And, and, and what I like about that is that exactly the point that I was going to make, that the school is not only about learning the tools to implement strategies, to implement, to implement math problems. That is important as well, to learn statistics, biology, history, math, uh, finance, strategic thinking, all that. That is important. That's in the books. But I also think that the real learning in the school is, you know, and some of you said it, school teaches you how to think, you know, how to rationalize stuff, how to compare things, right? It's like an exploration of things. Um, in my opinion, it also allows you to, to explore new things, new topics, to search for what you really like, right? And to kind of compare things and contrast things as well, right? Also, it teaches you how to interact with others, you know, how to work with people, how to present in front of students, or how to have a one-on-one -on -one interview conversations. So it teaches you how to interact with others too, right? Uh, it also allows you to build friendships. I mean, so many of you guys are going to go together through the same path, maybe go to the same university, maybe even apply to the same job. Who knows, right? So a school really allows you to build, to build long-lasting relationships. What it also does is uh, how to work with teams. And this is very important, guys, because those skills that you're learning uh, when you work together with your classmates, are the same skills that are going to help you when you go to work at companies and nonprofits and governmental uh, agencies and things like that. So working with teams, whether it's in academic groups, in sport groups, or in school clubs, uh, is teaching you that, giving you that, that ability to interact with others. <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing is that school teaches you how to plan. You know, how many, when you go to college, you're gonna see that you have to plan your classes accordingly, and you have to look at the schedule and look at when am I gonna take this class. Not only that, but it teaches you how to plan, how am I gonna study, when am I gonna study. If I'm going to have fun, when I could have fun, but let me just go and, and plan so I could study as well, right? So it teaches you how to plan. Also, it provides you with knowledge, of course. You know, you're reading the books, you go into class, you're asking questions to the teachers, uh, you're researching, so it, it teaches you that as well. You know, it brings you this knowledge into your brain that you can utilize however you, you think you should utilize it. Now, one of my, my favorite ones here is like, a school also provides you the tools to, you know, to go to work for your working life. But it's kind of boring in a way because I haven't met anybody that says, Oh, I'm ready for my working life. You know, I'm going to go to work, and I'm so excited about it. It's hard to find that, right? Like, most people are like, oh, I have to go to work, 9 to 5, and I'm tired. So that's, if you're feeling that way about a job, then maybe that's not a job for you. And finally, when you graduate from high school, when you graduate from college, is sort of kind of that decision time where you're going to sort of decide if you haven't yet. So what am I going to do with all this education, right? Where am I going? Uh, what do I really like? What is my passion? What is, so it's sort of a decision time. So the next slide, I'm going to show you my career path and the decisions that I made along the way that took me where I'm at today. Uh, this is not the path for everybody. This is on an example. And it's not necessarily in that order or anything like that. But I wanted to show you something, guys. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> She's very mad, yeah. Right, she looks choked by a cable. Anybody else? Stress, choked by the cables. She what again? Yeah, she's entangling the cords, exactly. And the reason why I wanted to show you guys this picture along with the, what is coming is that when it comes to decision time, especially if you are going to pursue a career in technology, there are a lot of myths in technology that make people afraid of following a career in technology, right? So the first thing that people think that uh, if I'm going to pursue a career in technology, if you were to pursue one, is that it's so hard. It's like, oh my God, technology is so hard. I don't know if I'll be able to learn all the codes and everything. Some of the people think that it's complicated. Oh, it's so many cables, so, so many software, so many applications. I don't know what to do with them. So those are the myths that, uh, that we're gonna break today. 
Uh, so many cables, of course, right? Uh, I'm not a developer. That's a common one. Like, oh, if you're not a developer, you can't go into technology. That's not true. The other one, oh, I'm not a programmer. That's not true either. You don't have to be a programmer if you want to go into technology. And I explain to you guys why. Um, I don't have a technology degree. I don't have a technology degree. And you don't have to have a technology degree to go into technology. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. I don't like computers. You know, people don't want to leave, deal with the hardware or anything like that. So those are some of the myths. Uh, I'm not a nerd. You know, <laughs> people think that you have to be a nerd to be in, the, in technology, in the technology industry, but no, you don't have to be a nerd. Nothing wrong with being a nerd. It's kind of in fashion right now, being a nerd. And last but not least, um, there are other myths, and I wanted to share with you guys the story about my nephew. When I was working for Apple, um, doing software deployments, I took my nephew to see Apple for the first time. And uh, he was a little nervous about going to Apple, and he was like, oh, I don't know what to expect, blah, blah, blah. So I took him to the campus in Cupertino, and uh, we walk into the building, and he's looking around, and he's in high school, my, my nephew. And he's like, wow, this, this is kind of different. So I took him to my office, or to the cubicles that we have there, and I introduced him to my coworkers, to people I knew there, to my boss and everything. Then I went to the, we went to the cafeteria, and in Apple they have a fancy cafeteria. So I, I showed him, look, these are the people that work here. And, uh, and you know, these are the people, so here they are. So he's thinking about Apple in technology before he went, went there. He thought that all of us were going to be in these little cubicles, typing on our computers, programming and developing and all that, and it was kind of dark and everything. So his, his myth, his uh, attitude towards technology and other things sort of kind of changed a little bit just by the exposure of him being there, right? So that was kind of an interesting thing. So this is my career path. So basically, um, I started in market research. And if you guys see the top, the top right of the, of the presentation there, those are the different industries that I started working with. That was my, like, my exploratory time when I was exploring what I liked, what I thought I liked, and maybe I, you know, I, I was just going there. So I started in market research. Oh, then I went to radio. I was doing sales for uh, selling advertising. Then I went to a nonprofit doing uh, a small business consulting. Then I got uh, into consulting for bigger businesses. And then I became an entrepreneur. But at this time, that was a very hard experience, the first time that I became an entrepreneur. And I went through a huge transition. So if you guys see that transition part, it was, it was bad. I mean, I went to, into business with somebody, and the company didn't do well. We were in business for like two years, and we ran out of funds. We ran out of money. We were broke. Uh, we had to let go of people. And the company went out of business. We literally had to close. So there I was with all this knowledge and energy and all this stuff, and I was broke. And I have no money, and I was sad, and I was depressed, and I didn't know what to do with my life. And, and, and it was transition time. And I said, I need to do something because my industry at the time was dying. Remember the degree that I got, international business and marketing? At the time, not today, but at the time it was kind of dying, too many people were going into it, and I wasn't finding a job. I was like, oh, I can't even find a job. So I needed to do something. So a friend of mine who used to work for Genentech, it's a biotech company in San Francisco, he said, look, I'm looking for a business analyst. If you go to the interview and you ace it, I'll hire you. I said, done. So what I did, I went to a library, and I got a book, and it was the Business Analyst Handbook. And I, it was this thick, this book. And I read that book from cover to cover. I memorized a lot of stuff. I did some exercises. I mean, I, I, I got a degree out of that book, I swear to God. And I went to the interview. And this is like two weeks later or something. And I got the job. And, and I was like, now what? I never done this thing. I've never been a business analyst. And I was so afraid, I was so nervous, and I was like, Butterflies in my stomach, like, shoot, I'm working for a, this huge corporation, Genentech, and what am I going to do? So my friend is like, look, dude, they're going to pay you, they're going to train you, they're going to just, just relax. So I went there, and I was with Genentech for about, all together for about three years, and I did great. And, and that was sort of my, my transition into technology, right? 
And, and the reason why I, I, I share with you that I did great is because um, I had to put the work, right? I had to put the work to, to, to make it great. I had to meet the people, go to the places, do the things that I need to do to actually get into the company. And because of that, I, I got into Anthem. I was recruited by a company in the East Coast, and I moved to the East Coast. That's when I lived in Washington and Virginia. And I moved there, and while I was there, I was getting my MBA. Do you guys see the star in the middle between IBM and Anthem? That's when I was getting my MBA program. So I was doing the MBA program full time. I was working full time. And it was about 18 months that I had to do that. So it was, it was a lot of hard work. So if you are going into any career, into any path, you have to put the work, right? You have to do it, and, and then you will get the rewards. So then, because of Anthem and the MBA, I was recruited by IBM. So, so all this point, I'm going up, right? Like I'm going up in my title, I'm going up in my salary, I'm going up in my knowledge in my career. And I was doing great in IBM. I was there for two years. Uh, but then um, I wanted to come back to the West Coast. I wanted to come back where my family is, right? And um, I started looking for jobs. And I was in Ireland uh, because of work. And I met somebody, some people from Apple. And they said, hey, we're looking for somebody with experience this and that, and I ended up applying to, to Apple, and I got the job at Apple in Cupertino. But guess what, guys? Guess what? Guess what, guys? I, do you know what happened when I was at Apple? I wasn't happy. I wasn't feeling like I was making an impact. Um, I had a good position there. I had a great salary, all the perks and everything. But I wasn't feeling like I was depressed. I was, I was just like, what am I doing here? I, I was just part of the little machine, you know, the little machine. And I wanted to do something different. And that's when I became an entrepreneur. I said, okay, with all this knowledge that I have, with education, with experience, what should I do? So I went through, through exploration. Remember that we were talking earlier about exploring and doing different things, kind of learning about different things to see what you like? I started exploring. And, um, and this is what I came out with. The ocean, how am I going to make a living out of the ocean, I thought. I love the ocean. It's, it's great. I mean, I love going to the beach. I, going to, I love the waves. I love being in the water. But what can I do with the ocean that I could create an impact somehow? And how can I be an agent of change? You know, if I want to do something, how can I do it? What can I do it? So I started researching and doing all this stuff. Guys, 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 pay attention here. <laughs> So I started doing a lot of research and everything, and this is what I found, guys. That the things that I like on the right, oh, sorry, on the left, the ocean, was becoming the thing on the right. So could you guys tell me what that is on the right? Pollution, yes. What else? Trash, exactly. What else? Plastic. Boom. That's the thing. And I'm like, where is this? plastic coming from? What is going on with what is going on with my paradise that is turning into this? The one the picture on top is an island, it's called the in the Maldives. It's an island that is covered with garbage. It's absolutely covered. The one in the bottom is Henderson Island, another island in the South Pacific. It's in the South America near there. Covered with garbage as well. And in the bottom, needless to say, thousands and thousands of plastic bottles. So say, what's going on with this? So the findings that I found uh, were, you know, this is a real problem. There is, there is this, all this garbage in the ocean, and there is no the technology to, to address this issue. And what I found is that, look, on the right, if you guys see the, the top 10 items collected in, from the ocean, all this garbage in the ocean, cigarette butts, food wrappers, beverage bottles, Grocery bags, where everything you guys that you could imagine, it's straws by the thousands of straws floating in the ocean. And so, what is all this garbage? Why do we have garbage in the ocean? What's going on here? And so, some people say, oh, you know, it's the garbage. What was, you know, what's the issue? Well, you know, this is the issue, right? Now, we not only have garbage in the ocean, which is a huge amount, but animals are getting killed because of the garbage. So, on the top left, the total, is it in a plastic bag? And why is it in a plastic bag? Because, okay, exactly. Because the total thing is a jellyfish, 
and it eats the garbage bag or, or the plastic bag. And what happens, they get so full that they think they're full and they don't eat anymore and they die. Also, sea lions are getting caught and other animals are getting caught in, in nets and in garbage itself. Uh, look, dolphins are swimming in, in, in garbage. And this is a real picture, guys. So it's a huge problem. And on the bottom left, I wanted to put the map because I say, okay, so whose problem is this? Is this a particular country? Is this a particular city or particular island? No, it's everybody's problem. We have five different garbage bags in the ocean that are of the size of Texas. And the one in the north is growing at an exponential rate that is insane. So it's everybody's problem because it's, it's our ocean. It's the, only, it's the only ocean we have. Uh, and, and this is why it matters because Top left, that yogurt container, that yogurt container was thrown into the ocean in 1976. And it was just picked up from the ocean. And you see, it doesn't degrade, doesn't do anything. It's just garbage floating in the ocean, right? Then on the bottom, on the bottom here, I mean, consumers are discarding all this, all, this, all this garbage. So it's a huge problem. The picture with the fish, we have a huge problem with microplastics. And I'll tell you what microplastics are in a little bit. And it's a whole change. And here is a little picture that depicts how garbage gets into the ocean. Okay? From the drains to, the, to the, some of the rivers to the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what I want to do, guys, I'm going to show you a four minute uh, uh, presentation about the, the trip that a plastic bottle takes into the ocean, okay? So let's do this. This is the story of three plastic bottles, empty and discarded. Their journeys are about to diverge with outcomes that impact nothing less than the fate of the planet. But they weren't always this way. To understand where these bottles end up, we must first explore their origins. The heroes of our story were conceived in this oil refinery. The plastic in their bodies was formed by chemically bonding oil and gas molecules together to make monomers. In turn, these monomers were bonded into long polymer chains to make plastic in the form of millions of pellets. Those were melted at manufacturing plants and reformed in molds to create the resilient material that makes up the triplets' bodies. Machines filled the bottles with sweet, bubbly liquid, and they were then wrapped, shipped, bought, opened, consumed, and unceremoniously discarded. And now here they lie, poised at the edge of the unknown. Bottle one, like hundreds of millions of tons of his plastic brethren, ends up in a landfill. This huge dump expands each day as more trash comes in and continues to take up space. As plastics sit there being compressed amongst layers of other junk, rainwater flows through the waste and absorbs the water-soluble compounds it contains, and some of those are highly toxic. Together, they create a harmful stew called leachate, which can move into groundwater, soil, and streams, poisoning ecosystems and harming wildlife. It can take bottle one an agonizing 1,000 years to decompose. Bottle 2's journey is stranger, but unfortunately no happier. He floats on a trickle that reaches a stream, a stream that flows into a river, and a river that reaches the ocean. After months lost at sea, he's slowly drawn into a massive vortex where trash accumulates, a place known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here, the ocean's currents have trapped millions of pieces of plastic debris. This is one of five plastic-filled gyres in the world's seas, places where the pollutants turn the water into a cloudy plastic soup. Some animals, like seabirds, get entangled in the mess. They, and others, mistake the brightly colored plastic bits for food. Plastic makes them feel full when they're not, so they starve to death and pass the toxins from the plastic up the food chain. For example, it's eaten by lanternfish. The lanternfish are eaten by squid. The squid are eaten by tuna. And the tuna are eaten by us. And most plastics don't biodegrade. 
which means they're destined to break down into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics, which might rotate in the sea eternally. But Bottle 3 is spared the cruel purgatories of his brothers. A truck brings him to a plant where he and his companions are squeezed flat and compressed into a block. Okay, this sounds pretty bad too, but hang in there, it gets better. The blocks are shredded into tiny pieces, which are washed and melted so they become the raw materials that can be used again. As if by magic, Bottle 3 is now ready to be reborn as something completely new. For this bit of plastic with such humble origins, suddenly, the sky is the limit. Awesome. How do you guys like the video? Pre-telling, right? Pre-telling. So before we, we finish, and I, and, I, and I share with you the last two slides, so what are we going to do with this little bottle right here? What are we going to do with it? Recycle it, right? But it's not only recycle it, but recycle it in the, proper, in the proper way. We cannot discard it just as it is because it will die in the ocean, right? So basically, you know, what can I do with, this, with all this, right? Um, how can I create an impact? How can I add this issue in the ocean that is happening? And uh, how can I help? You know, I'm one person. And, you know, what can I do? So if I take action, I could create an impact. And if I create an impact, I could influence change. And that's what I'm trying to do. And how am I going to, to do it? I'm going to do it to the company that I founded that is called Tech Corp Solutions. And what it is is, is ocean plastic and environmental pollution. Utilizing the latest technologies to collect, to process, recycle, and reclaim ocean plastic. So that's, that's my goal for the company. And how I came out with this goal in this company. Basically, you know, we all seen the alarming rates of garbage in the ocean, right? And I just showed you guys a video that is so true. And you could Google it, you could research it. All these statistics are there. This is not a hoax. This is a true thing that is happening in the ocean. And, and I say, I need to do something. You know, I need to create public awareness of what is happening, but I also need to address the affected areas in, you know, how are we gonna do it? So basically, what we do is we, we assist governments uh, or businesses to create an end-to-end -end recycling program uh, for their country. And also, we accomplish this by providing the equipment, by providing the transportation machinery, the process of how to recycle, and, and pretty much get the plastic out of the, out of the ocean. And not only out of the ocean, but into recycling plants so they could process it and make it into a chair, make it into a carpet, make it into that table, that red plastic. So that's what I do, guys. Um, the last picture on the, on the right bottom, this is not the actual ship, but um, there are prospects of building a, a, a boat like that that will actually collect the, uh, the plastic from the ocean. Today, there are companies, there's one company actually doing that, but that ship costs $5 million. So I want to sort of create something cheaper that we could actually do it at a smaller scale. So that's, that's what I have for you guys today. And um, you know, hopefully you, you enjoyed something, that you could take something with you, either about the career that I went through, either about the education that I took, or what I'm trying to do today. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free, and uh, we take it from there. Yeah. Any questions? So we have time for one or two questions. So okay. When you said that one of your businesses um, made you broke, what was your business about? The one that fell? Okay, so that business was about online branding. So we'll do, we do all the online branding for businesses that wanted to have a presence in the internet. And I think the timing of it wasn't the right timing because there were so many players in the marketplace. So we were just another person doing that, another company doing that. And so the business ran out of funds, we didn't get enough clients, so we didn't get enough tracking for that business. So it was online branding. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? I think I saw a hand over there. You had a question earlier? Okay, cool. Anybody? Oh, you have a question? Oh yeah, I think you had a question there. What's your favorite thing that you could turn the trash into? My favorite thing that I could turn the trash into? Hmm. That's interesting. I haven't picked one, but I will say that carpets. 
<laughs> I could be into car into this. That would think, why? Because you could use a lot of it. So all this could be all recycled. So it's just the magnitude of how many plastics they could, they could use. Yeah, and we'll have plenty more time. Um, Oscar's actually going to stay with us for lunch. And so I encourage you all to ask lots of questions then and get his autograph and get pictures with him as well. But we're going to wrap up here real quick. And just to ask one more question, um, what kind of advice do you have for all of these students as they move forward and think about all the different things that they want to do with their future? OK, thank you, Kate. Um, the advice would be to, to explore. The, guys would be, the advice would be to really research what you like, no matter how small or how big it is. Just explore. Go through the motions of learning things and, and try different things. You guys are so young. When you go to college, you know, you'll be in your early 20s. Just explore different companies, different organizations. Uh, and if you find something that you like, then stick with it. But if you don't, it's not, nothing wrong with moving on to another company and just learning a, a few things from there. So the advice is don't stay still. Move forward. And, and just to close, Martin Luther King said, if you can run, then walk. If you can walk, then crawl. And if you can crawl, do whatever you want, but always move forward. And that will be my advice, always move forward. So thank you so much, guys. I appreciate your time. Thanks All for right, being thank here. All right, thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Kate. Thank you.